So in the last video, we just finished gathering a trace of this program here. Just to recap, this is a very simple file parser. It just reads in 1024 bytes and then does some computation based on that. It's just a test program to demonstrate this emulator. How we did that was via a pin tool. So if you recall, the pin tool produced a trace file, which was essentially just a series of events. So we have image loads, we have debug events, and we have instruction execution. It also produced a dump of the program's memory once it started tracing, and some memory dumps from syscalls that modify memory. It also produced a thread context which it will begin executing in. So this was the thread context when the program started tracing. So in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to just quickly go over how we load this trace into the emulator. Then we're going to talk about how we hook uh, functions called by the program um, in our emulator to replace arguments or to retrieve results or just instrument the program. Uh, we do this so we can do things like getting file descriptors that are associated with file names or replacing bytes that are read in by read with symbolic data and so forth. So, just to begin, as you might expect, we have a trace parser. The trace parser takes as arguments the path to the trace file and also the syscall dump directory. And then we just start loading events from that. So we can see the first event is an image load event, which is this event here. And we would then expect to see another image load, another image load, some debug information, and then an instruction event. And we can see that with the instruction execution event, we also get the address that that instruction resides at. Okay, so that's just to give you an idea of how we load this trace into the emulator itself. Then running the emulator, we just provide a number of arguments. So paths to the trace file, the memory dump directory, the thread context, a hooks directory, which will contain um, hook files that we will discuss in a few minutes. And then we just tell the tracer, or sorry, the emulator, what type of operating system we're emulating because there may be some operating specific um, handling. So let's just have a quick look at what that looks like when we run it. So we can see, first of all, we get some hooks loaded. And then because we're running in debug mode, what we'll see is the emulator itself is going to log the instructions executed. So we can see the first uh, instruction we uh, traced was a push EVP. We see the read reg registers, we see the written registers, written memory, and then so on and so forth. The next was then a move, ESP into EVP, and so on. So I'm just going to restart the emulator, not in debug mode, because it just takes too long to run through everything. Okay, so the first thing that we typically want to do when we begin emulating a trace is we need to figure out where we actually want to introduce symbolic data into the system. So to do that, we use function hooking. So how we do this is we have HKS files, basically that specify hooks that we associate with a particular image. So in this case, this is libc. And this is just a stripped down version of the hooks for this particular test case. So we can see that we provide hooks for lseq, open, read, fread, and memcopy. All those are, are Python classes within this libc.py associated with an RVA that when executed will call the pre and post hooks. So if we have a look in here, this is the pre hook for open, which we can see that we've just hit a breakpoint within. So this hook is hit once the emulator detects that the RVA is specified in this HKS file, BF860, is in EIP. 
So as mentioned, the reason we want to hook open is we want to associate a file name with the file descriptor. So these hooks all take the current thread context and the current memory map. So what that means is at this point we have available to us the correct thread context that the program actually had at this point in execution. So we can retrieve, for example, the stack pointer um, or the base pointer. This allows us to get the arguments that were passed to this function. So we know that from the memory map we can uh, get bytes or D words. ESP plus four will, should contain a pointer to the string, which is the file to open. So as you can see here, we would expect at this address, if we start getting bytes, that we would get back um, a string. So slash slash h so obviously there's going to be slash home slash sean slash whatever and we can see that this is effectively what the pre-hook for open does just iterates over that string until it hits a null byte and then at the end it packs that data into a python string so we can see that from memory we've correctly retrieved the file name that was passed to open so this is just really to give you an idea of how the hooking itself works. So essentially we have these Python hooks that can run within the context of the emulator and that have access to the thread data and the memory data of the program at that point. So if we continue, we're eventually going to hit this post hook, which again has access to the uh, thread context. So what we want to do here is we want to get the return value of open. So the return value will be in EAX. And what this tells us is that the file descriptor, which we have here, six, is associated with the open file um, input. So that we can then store that, and we know that in future, if we have reads from file descriptor six, then they're going to be on this particular file. So let's let that continue. So the next thing that we're going to look at is how we can hook read. So as I said, the reason we want to hook read is so that we can replace concrete data read in by the program with symbolic data, which we indicate as user controlled. So one of the things that I haven't explained so far is what do we actually mean by symbolic data? Well, effectively, symbolic data, in our case, we replace normal numeric values, like say one, 10, 1,000 or whatever, with Python objects that we have overloaded all the operators, so addition, subtraction, multiplication, and so forth, so that when we have um, some arithmetic operator, instead of getting back a concrete value, we get back a new value that represents an expression tree, where that expression tree gives um, the range that that value might actually hold. So just to demonstrate, A free var just represents an unconstrained variable. We specify a width and a name. Okay, and these essentially represent 32-bit um, wide bit vectors. So we can add them together. And instead of getting back a normal numeric value as you would with integers, we get back an object that represents the addition. So, so we can see that we have, as I mentioned, an expression tree where we have the addition of two free variables. So that isn't particularly interesting. Um, what it become, when it becomes more interesting though is when these um, operators are chained together. So for example, can see here now that we have 
instead of just the addition, we also have a multiplication of that by 10, and we can continue on, say, and these trees grow and grow, and typically what will happen within a program is that as we emulate um, instructions, so add, sub, etc., so on and so forth, these trees get deeper and deeper and deeper. So in typical programs like file parsers, where um, if you've got a lot of arithmetic, you might end up with trees that are you know, thousands of layers deep. So there's just lots of add, subs, shifts, concatenation, bit vector extraction, so on and so forth. So that's really all that um, kind of arithmetic over symbolic data is. Instead of getting back um, explicit concrete results, we get back results that are represent the expressions. So we can also do things like um, express equality or inequality. Which will obviously be useful for emulating things like um, tests and then comparisons, which we will need for handling conditional jumps. So we can see here we have a tree that represents an equality between the expression we had before and five. So which will obviously be a, a true false value depending on these. Okay, so if we go back to our emulator, we can see that we've hit the pre-hook on read. So as mentioned before, we have the context available to us so we can get the count, the pointer, and the file descriptor arguments that were passed to read. We can see this is a read from file descriptor six, which we've already associated with the file name that we provided to the program through the open hook. And the count is 1024. If we recall, that read is effectively this one here. So instead of actually providing this information to the emulator, what we've done is we have uh, derived it by emulating all the instructions that executed before that. So the interesting hook, though, I guess, is the post hook on read. So what we're going to do here is we again we have the pointer so we know that read will have read 1024 bytes into this address um, in fact we can check the return value of read to find out exactly how many bytes it did read so we can see in this case it is 1024 but uh, you can see in the code here that we ensure that it does return correctly and how many bytes are read or is retrieved from eax so what we now want to do is replace these concrete bytes with symbolic data. How the concrete data is actually fed in is using the syscall hooks, or sorry, syscall dumps that men we mentioned previously. So behind the scenes, there will have been um, an event that will have told the emulator to load those 1024 concrete bytes from the syscall dump file. So what we're now going to do is we're going to iterate over those concrete bytes and replace them with symbolic data. So going to single step through this loop. We can see we've retrieved the concrete value here by getting from memory at that address. So, and we can see that it is in fact an A, so we would expect uh, the 1024 A's to be at this address. So what we then do is we create a new free variable. In this case, the bit width is eight. We associate a tag with it just to give some information. And we also store the concrete value. This will become important later because one of the main advantages of um, white box fuzzing over symbolic emulation is that sometimes when you um, don't have enough information to correctly conclude what the symbolic value should be, you can just revert to the concrete value. So we store the initial concrete value, so if we need to, we can revert to both. We can see here that we have a free variable that we've just created. Then we store that value back in memory. So now if we retrieve the byte value, we can see that instead of getting back an A, we get back a free variable. So essentially what this means is when the program continues execute, executing and starts reading from this buffer that was passed to read, instead of getting back concrete values, it's going to get back symbolic ones. 
Um, so that's pretty much it for this part of the video. Um, what we've covered is just how we introduce symbolic data into the emulator through hooks. In the second part of this video, we're going to go into what it looks like when the emulator, emulator itself starts operating on these. So where that gets particularly interesting is in the context of um, conditional jumps. So from conditional jumps, what we're going to see is that we're going to be get, instead of concrete flags, we're going to get symbolic flags. And from those, we're going to start trying to generate new inputs for the program. Um, again, if you've got any comments or questions, you can check out my blog at seanhn.wordpress.com. Thank you.